we uh, put this uh, presentation together because uh, as most people probably that are on this uh, call, we've known somebody, we've, we've, we've lived this with somebody um, or we are seeing it in our future. Um, we thought it was really important. Uh, Pernima came and spoke uh, to a meeting that uh, we were at, I don't know, four or five years ago, something like that. And it was such great, valuable information um, that we decided to kind of put a presentation together for the chapter because on Zoom, we can go out to, to our database for, for several of our chapters or really all of our chapters. So um, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about Joyce, about the SSG Academy at this point, or we can wait till the end. Sure, you can take it away. Our purpose will be coming up, you'll be going on. Okay, so, great. All right, so um, the SSG uh, purpose, and we, we are a nonprofit uh, foundation for senior services to provide older adults and their loved ones with education, valuable resources and quality services to help seniors preserve their independence and improve their overall well-being and to support and advocate for seniors in need to help ensure that all seniors are well cared for and can age with dignity without consideration of social, economic, and cultural status. SSG is how the foundation provides services for the members or the people that are called and are interested. It's called the Senior Specialist Group, and we're a group of vetted senior uh, we, we work with seniors in our industries, a vetted group of professionals that support our areas. Our chapter is the South Bay chapter. We go as far as Long Beach to Marina Del Rey, I believe, um, and inside to, I guess, Carson area, somewhere around there. No, Carson is to the right. Um, but anyway, that's the, we're happy to work with anyone in this neighborhood. And then we find people that can support the needs of the seniors in our area. All right. So today, um, as I said, we we really felt like this driving topic was an important one to get out there. So our um, the speaker we uh, got from uh, Providence Little Company of Mary in the in the San Pedro um, uh, facility there. Uh, Pranima is an occupational therapist and certified driving rehab specialist. Since 2011, she has been working at Providence Little Company of Mary, working with clients with acquired brain injury. Uh, she has launched driving programs at various hospitals and has her own practice providing driving assessment services. And Therese Thompson um, was able to join us today too. So we actually have somebody from the DMV, which is, we're very honored to have <laughs> her here. Um, she currently serves as the driver safety manager working as the senior driver ombudsman for LA and Central Coast counties. And she partners with senior organizations like ours uh, to bring DMV information to mature drivers and assist drivers who have been referred to the driver safety branch of the DMV. Um, so from our chapter today, me, um, I'm Abby Waddell. Um, I am a senior real estate specialist, and I work with older clients um, all over the place uh, to make uh, decisions about transitions that they might need on housing. Uh, Jill Love, uh, who is also in our chapter, she's a geriatric care manager with Peters and Love, and she'll be uh, providing a couple tips since she works with many clients who have um, had driving issues as well. And then um, Grace St. Clair, uh, who is an attorney and she's the head of our chapter. Uh, she is an estate planning attorney. So I'll move on and Pernima will head us off with stay behind the wheel as long as you can. Thank you. Thank you all. First of all, you know, Jill, Abby, Grace, everyone, thank you for inviting us to do this presentation. And thanks to all of you who, have, who are participating in this presentation. And you know, I, I'm so passionate about this topic that you know, any opportunity I get, I just want to be able to do this so that you know, I can clear some of the misconceptions that we have 
Because a lot of times when patients are coming or clients are being referred to me, they think I'm the DMB person. Sorry, Teresa, nothing to against DMB, but you know, um, that's they, what they feel is that I'm going to be doing a pass or a fail. So I'm going to clarify some of those misconceptions and you know, um, make it easy on all our clients or all the family members who are facing this challenging issue of driving. We all want to stay independent as long as we can. We don't want to give up the keys, but we all should know one thing that California is, we are fortunate to be here. We do not have the age limit where we can renew a license. The oldest person that I have done a driving assessment has been 98. And he also got his license. Re I mean, he just came to me. He says, you know, I just want to check out because he was being tested by the DMV. So he wanted to do like a refresher course. And he came to us with no specific diagnosis or any particular condition, but just wanted to see if he was you know, fit to continue to drive. And he did get his license you know, renewed. So it's not the age that matters, it's the impaired function. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what those impaired function could mean. And that could be the limiting factor. Even I've seen people in their thirties or forties have so many challenges because due to the medical condition or things have changed a little bit. So let's move on. Next, please. So just giving a little bit um, information about, you know, what are the facts and you know, why are we talking a lot about the older drivers? You know, it's the fastest growing segment of the, our population here. And we are living longer than we used to. And why it has become such a huge issue. I'm sure some of you may know the Santa Monica accident. You know, the person, um, Mr. Robert Weller, he had history of, you know, accidents, fender benders, uh, but nobody attended to that. None of the doctors or the family members were scared to talk about the driving issue. And he ran through the Santa Monica Mar Farmers Market, killing nine people and injuring numerous people. So that caused that national attention. And that's why it became a huge you know, goal for the National Highway Safety to address the older driver safety. So we are all facing this uh, complex problems you know, we want to make sure that we continue to drive safely till we, you know, till we live, hopefully. But, you know, that at what time we need to reassess, okay, am I changing? What is changing here that we need to um, make that decision of giving up driving? Thank you. Next, please. So this is the picture of the Santa Monica accident that caused that national attention and, you know, you know, I got my certification in driving rehab in 2006, but at that time I was, you know, most of the patients or the clients that I used to see that were all related to the traumatic brain injury, stroke or other conditions, Parkinson's, but the older driver safety became a huge issue since 2009 and 10. And you know, there was a committee formed within the driver safety office, senior ombudsman came in, uh, place and uh, Teresa can talk a little bit more about it, but this is where it started the conversation about the older driver safety. Next one, please. So think about it as we age, you know, things change and driving is such a complex task that it's putting so many demands on us. And, you know, how we, you know, become slower with the movement, slower, it also affects our thinking skills or our thinking processes a vision is changing. And we will talk a little bit about you know, each component as we move along. But why do we think that, you know, and a lot of our seniors, a lot of my clients that come to me, they've already made changes the way they drive or the way they used to drive. So it's not clear black and white here that you know, everybody experiences the same changes or you know, challenges as the aging but things are changing and how we change our driving habits along with that. We are going to focus a little bit on that so that it's not like, okay, it's not like you cannot continue to drive or can we continue to drive within our neighborhood? We'll talk, discuss more about that. Next, please. Yeah, 
So what are the functional abilities? What do we need to continue to drive safely? Of course, vision is the first important one. Vision, and we'll talk in detail about the vision part, the cognition, and what does cognition mean? It's about basically your thinking skills. Thinking skills are, you know, that is the most challenging part, which it's a hidden challenge, which people sometimes are not able to figure out what is changing and why it is um, becoming more challenging with the driving. And then the motor function, that means, you know, it could be anything, your tightness, your arthritis, your limited motion in your neck, or, you know, having uh, difficulty handling, um, you know, multiple things at the same time, having some adaptive equipment, using a walker or a cane, that could be making changes. And I, you know, personally tell everybody, motor function, that means your challenges that are physically impairing, those are the least of the problems that we can think of, but we need to make sure that we are addressing the vision and the cognition and how we can keep up with that. So let's talk about that. So why is vision so critical? Remember vision is, you know, 80% of our brain has vision channels, you know, going from the back of the head to the front. You know, there's constantly um, back and forth information. If it is working well, if our vision is working extremely well, you know, we, we really do better in all aspects because that is our gateway. Yeah. How we, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so if there is any dysfunction in the vision, if any little change, it interferes with our performance and, and it affects our driving performance. So let's go and talk about what are the different vision conditions that can be affected. Next one, please. We know as simple as cataracts, you know, people have, you know, as we age, cataracts is one of the things that most of us are experiencing. People have cataract surgery, they get the lens implant and, you know, things can be resolved with the vision part because what happens is the, at night, the glare is bothering us. And then there are conditions like glaucoma. It's, um, I'll show you the picture as we move along and then the macular degeneration and then the diabetic retinopathy is very common with patients who have, or clients who have diabetes. And, you know, they, they experience patchy vision and that could be a fluctuating vision. It's just not, you know, sometimes their vision may be okay. They may be seeing things clearly, but if the blood sugar levels are changing that can affect their vision, it can get blurry. So being, you know, getting a good eye exam every year, every six months, depending on what your conditions are. Please, please, I encourage a lot of my clients, you know, to get a good eye exam at least every six months if you have a condition. The glaucoma is the eye pressure, you know, it affects the peripheral vision. And you can see the pictures as we move along. Next one, please. So, Think about the cataracts. The, you know, this is the, on the left side of your screen, you can see that the normal vision, you know, the incoming light is to get a clear picture. But with cataracts, the, the light is scattered and it becomes hazy and there's a, like an opaque film on the lens of the eye and that can make the vision very blurry and it misses, and then we miss the clarity of the vision. The next one, please is the glaucoma. How does the glaucoma affect? It affects the peripheral of the eye. I mean, the peripheral vision of the eye. So, you know, in the early stages only, the, I mean, it's because the optic nerve is being damaged or it is getting affected because of the condition and people experience loss of vision in one area. It could be on the top part of the right eye or the left eye or the bottom. And that's how it starts with the peripheral vision being, you know, constricted. And then of course it can encroach the central vision. But usually when somebody has glaucoma, they go to the DMV, they do a vision test. It can be missed because you know the central vision is pretty clear and they can see or read the chart pretty well. And they can, you know, sometimes be missed at the DMV you know, office and they cannot, but of course with the advanced condition, it can change. Next one, please. The, this is the vision with the um, age-related macular degeneration. 
And what does that do? Is that it affects the central vision. So it's the detailed part, you know, it affects the reading, it affects how you see things at, you know, on the computer, because there's a little patch or a black spot in the center part and any near task that you do that can get affected. What that means is that, you know, many times the patient have to move their head or to move their eyes to be able to see things clearly because there are certain areas of the eye or the retina or the macula you can call that have clear vision and they can move their head and eye and they, they can see things clearly. But with most lot of advancement, I mean, in the condition or in the disease process, that central part can get enlarged. I mean, they get bigger and bigger and it affects their daily activities. Even like, you know, taking medic, reading their medications bottles that can be affected. And think about it, how it affects the driving when your central part, you know, you could be missing the, um, the signal lights, the traffic lights, you may be seeing the traffic signs, you know. I've seen patients who miss signs for no left turn. There's a cent on the top, there's a light uh, with the sign says no left turn and patients still just not see it and they miss it. Next one, please. So what, are we, what do we need really from visual perspective? What do we need for continue to drive safely? We need the near and the far vision. You know, we need to be able to read our speedometer. So that's our near vision. In the far vision, we should be able to read signs. We should be able to see the traffic lights and traffic signs. And then we need a depth perception. What is that, you know, how close you parked, um, you stop at the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, how close you stop at the light, you know, behind the car that requires depth perception. How do you put your car in a parking space? That is the visual spatial scale, you know, in a parking spot, parking between two cars, how you position your lane, I mean, the lane positioning. Um, many times, if somebody has experienced a loss of peripheral vision or vision on the outside of their eye or visual field cut, they are missing one part of the eye. The ch challenges that the person experiences is the lane positioning they drift to one side, they're getting too close to the right side or the left side. And, you know, if you're cognitively able to correct it or thinking wise, you're able to correct it, then you can pull you. You hear in a lot of time patients or my clients don't pay attention that they're going over the lane dividers and they fail to uh, correct their lane position. And that's where we are, the challenges. You know, the challenges I also see is during left-hand turns, you know, they are um, missing part of the vision and they are going over the median lane, the yellow lines, and they cross over and go on the opposite side of the road. So those are the challenges when there are cha changes in their peripheral vision or the sp visual spatial skills, or, you know, they are not able to look around. They're not able to pay attention. Those, now a lot of time, what is visual attention? It's very challenge or it is difficult to discriminate whether visually attending it or cognitively attending it. It's hard to discriminate that. But visual attention is basically you're searching, you're paying attention. Think about it, you are at a traffic light. You're paying attention to the red light, but you're still paying attention to the cross traffic if there are any pedestrians. If you're making a left-hand turn at an uncontrolled intersection, what that means is there is no left arrow, but you are going to make that left-hand turn. So you have to watch the light. You have to watch the oncoming traffic. You have to watch for any pedestrians um, in the crosswalk. So there's so much involved and all that is a complex task. So thinking wise, visually, they all have to work together to accomplish that task. Next one, please. So this is in a lot of times people have fluctuating vision and especially they experience the fatigue. When someone has any changes in their visual input, that means you know, they can't see things clearly or they have a visual field cut, field cut and that can be affected due to either 
stroke or brain injury or other medical condition, they have loss of vision in one eye. Then there is, you know, recently I have a, I have a client actually right now at the hospital working with, you know, recently had a loss of vision in one eye. So the brain needs time to adjust to the mono vision. That means, you know, seeing with one eye, the depth perception we talked about, we need two eyes together to be able to do that. So that can cause a lot of fatigue. That means you get really tired because the job of our looking around with two eyes is being now just taken over by the one eye, which is the good eye or the healthy eye. So that can cause a lot of visual fatigue and patients are constantly reporting that they get so tired. Think about it, our world is connected through our eyes and if we are constantly struggling to keep up with that, it makes it really hard. So next one, please. So like we talked about, you know, the hemianopsia is the word that is used for visual field cut or somebody has um, field cut due to the stroke or brain injury. And a lot of pe times people even experience double vision when they're tired. And then we talk a little bit about the visual inattention. What's happening is that when we drive, you know, as with, especially with the aging, that visual inattention, that means, you know, we are not able to pay attention to multiple things at the same time. And that's why, you know, pedestrians are missed or the lights are missed and the, up, and the challenge comes even with the uncontrolled left-hand turns. I mean, a lot of my clients, they change their driving behaviors by just making, you know, they don't want to do the uncontrolled left-hand turn. They go right, right, right. And they get to that destination by making those changes in their driving habits. And that's nothing wrong in it. It's okay to adapt to, you know, and see what, you know, makes it more challenging and how you can accommodate those changes or challenges by modifying your driving habits. Next one, please. So let's talk a little bit about the cognition and that what mean, it means is the thinking. You know, we all are present here attending to my presentation here, but think about it, the end product is the behavior. I'm not able to see what you're thinking. I mean, and a lot of you may be thinking, oh, you know, of, oh, I need to take care of this or my, what my, you know, next hour is going to be. So we cannot see what somebody's thinking. All we see when I'm doing a driving assessment, I see the end product and that's the behavior. And that means how they are driving, they're driving performance. If they're having challenges, you know, many times I've done the paper pencil test and I see how their distraction is affecting them at our hospital. And then I see those same distraction affecting their driving performance. It's just difficult for them to be able to follow two-step instructions or able to follow, you know, let's say we are asking them to make a right at um, light, uh, right turn, and then make a left turn at the next light. So they are just so focused on the driving that it is a challenge for them to pay attention. So, and that's why they miss it or their end product gets, the driving performance gets affected. Next one, please. So like I mentioned earlier, um, behavior is the end product, but it is, you know, how internally we are distracted or how the external distraction affects and that's how our performance comes across. So if you are, a lot of times I give this example is when the clients are coming to me for a driving test, you know, I tell them, the first thing I tell them, I'm not DMV, I don't do pass or fail. Because internally, if they're very anxious about this testing process, and I, you know, typically would try to make them as comfortable as I can. And I tell them, think about it, that you're going to practice with us. It's a refresher thing. And you are giving, you're getting an opportunity to see where you need to make changes. You know, a lot of people, a lot of us, all of us do this rolling stop, those California stops. And, you know, how they are sometimes that internally distraction, internal distraction causes that anxiety causes the result in having problems with their driving performance on the, and they are so distracted externally also with everything that's coming at them. 
you know, if there is a cognitive challenge, that means, you know, complex, complex intersections, think about it. You're paying attention to the oncoming car, you're paying attention to no left turn here, or it's a one way street. The challenge that I've seen with most of my, most of my clients is just they focus what is right in front of them that visual lead or the lead that they need to have to see what is ahead of them or what is the what does this intersect intersection looks like that becomes a challenge and then that is an external distraction that makes it really challenging for them to do again i know we don't like to do multitask but driving is a lot of multitasking and it challenges us more when we have any medical condition that affects our thinking process. Next one, please. So what are the cognitive skills? Um, I know we, um, jumping a little bit here. Um, attention is the foundation skill. You know, if you cannot pay attention, you can miss a lot of things. Problem solving, in a lot of times there's a construction zone. Think about it, a construction zone, we have to navigate through those workers, the cones and that, and sometimes causes the distraction for us. You know, remembering memory is another one is that, you know, knowing what the signs mean, what these um, stop means. Many times patients even have those challenges, not remembering, understanding what the sign, and it could be a combination of their memory or the visual spatial skills. You know, how they plan, how they, you know, if they have to make a right hand turn, how they are going to get into the right side you know, get into those broken lines, watch for the bicyclist, you know, turn their head and make sure that they are not missing a pedestrian or a bicyclist coming from the right side when they make a right hand turn. That judgment, you know, with the outcoming, oncoming car, when do you make that left turn? Trying to, um, you know, judge the distance of the car from where you are and the speed of the oncoming car. So those are all combination of cognitive skills that we require. Next one, please. So a lot of these conditions, like a brain injury, which can you know cause changes in their th thinking, changes in their cognition or the thinking skills. Some of the neuromuscular diseases, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, of course, different kinds of dementia, where it can be Alzheimer's or it can be vascular dementia. You know, if you have experienced a cardiac episode or a cardiac arrest and you have had a history, I mean, there is a syncope that means, you know, you have fainted or you have loss of consciousness for a period of time that can also affect the brain and it can affect the driving performance. And there are different uh, mental health conditions. There's a huge um, tsunami, I would say, with mental health condition with you know, um, the pandemic, a lot of patients or the clients are experiencing changes with their thinking and that is affecting, of course, their mental health, the depression, the anxiety. A lot of people stop driving because of the pandemic and getting back on the road has become a real challenge with a lot of our clients or our patients with our health, senior population. And of course, then there are, um, different health conditions like diabetes, sleep apnea, they're all conditions that can affect your driving performance or your thinking skills. Next, please. And this is the huge one, you know, many times um, the doctors are not discussing some of the impact that the medications can have on the driving. The combination of medications, you know, it could be over the counter, but sometimes it's affecting, you know, if somebody is taking a sleeping medication or you know, sleep for their sleep, and if they're taking other medications for their conditions, like for Parkinson's, you know, and taking those medications are affecting their alertness, they're getting, you know, drowsy, more drowsy. So, you know, it's always good to discuss with the physician why are some of these muscles, I mean, why is, uh, why are you experiencing severe drowsiness or decreased alertness while driving? So it's a very good discussion to have. Alcohol is another one. Some of the people are taking, uh, you know, uh, muscle relaxants for their back pain. So all those combination of medications can affect 
your alertness, awareness, causing drowsiness, and can affect the driving performance. Next one, please. Fatigue is another one. People who are tired, um, they definitely need to consider that, you know, of course, we all, at some point of time, we all get tired and we need to make changes in um, our driving times. You know, a lot of our clients are coming to me and they say, you know, they do not drive during rush hours or they don't, you know, if they feel sleepy, they pull over to the side and just take a little uh, break or, you know, especially long distance driving, it's, it's affecting um, how you perform on the road. You know, people might be honking at you. There are special, you know, I recently saw a patient with ALS, that amyotrophic lateral sclerosis cell that can, that's fatigue is such a huge factor for the, the person who has a medical condition. So think about it and think about conditions that can really affect your um, you know, physical or cognitive fatigue. So thank you. Next one, please. Like I said, physical evaluation is the easiest one to handle. It's the easiest one to manage it. And we can have so many adaptive things available to make your driving safe. The range of motion. You know, sometimes, you know, with aging comes the limited range of motion with our neck. And, you know, I always demonstrate where the blind spots are, how far they need to look over the shoulder for changing lanes or making a turn looking for the bicycle. I know DMV is, sorry, Teresa, again, DMV is not caught up with the technology. You know, we have these backup cameras, but the DMV's requirement is that you have to look behind when you look, I mean, when you're backing up. So even if someone ending up taking a DMV test, you wanna be prepared for those kinds of moments. Many times I do tell people that, you know, if you are, have limitation in your neck motion, you can always move your body. You can turn all the way back and be able to see behind. If that is not a possibility, somebody with a neck surgery or a back surgery, there are special mirrors available and we can introduce those mirrors to you during our driving test or driving assessment. And we can help those clients with some adaptive mirrors to make that decision. Um, sensation is another one, you know, people have neuropathy and people are missing you know, many times they have to make changes the way they drive hand controls and many times I've recommended the person has good vision, good cognition, or able to learn something that's new with the hand controls. I, I'm always promoting that, you know, you can continue to drive, but now you'll have some adaptations in the car. You know, we see a lot of patients with neuropathy and they are transitioning to hand controls and that is a possibility. You know, how your activity tolerance is, how your coordination is, you know, people with Parkinson's or sometimes it's not even Parkinson's, it's essential tremors that you know people have hereditary, that means in the hands are shaking, but how do they stabilize their steering wheel? And many times, you know, um, they may have so many, I mean, when I do the paper pencil test, they have a hard time doing anything to do with the writing. But when I see them in the car, they are really good at managing the steering. They are able to stabilize it and not experiencing any jerky movements. So with Parkinson's or Huntington's disease, sometimes you can see some jerky movements, but that can also be um, a fact. I mean, that can also be addressed during the driving assessment. Next one, please. Oh, going back a little bit on the hearing part, the reason hearing I've introduced is because you know, many times if there's an ambulance or a fire truck, if you have issues with your hearing, you may be missing that and people don't pull over to the right or even, even stop where they are. Sometimes it's not possible to move over to the right. So you still need to be able to hear the sirens and it's coming from somewhere knowing where it is and make that decision. So we talked about the a poor sensation and the other one is the falls. Many times people are experiencing a lot of falls at home and that is a concern when it even comes to driving. So falls are one of the biggest reasons for our clients to be admitted to the nursing home and you know becomes a challenge to get independent going back home safely and and because of that they lose their driving privileges 
So just in general, the flexibility and the strength, if they're decreased, you know, you can get some therapy for that and get better with those, some of the skills that we can address and have a modification. Like, you know, someone who has arthritis in the hand, cannot turn on the um, ignition. We have adaptation for adaptive keys for that. Uh, a seat belt, you know, it's so important. People sometimes have to use a different kind of a pull, you know, there's a belt available and you can have an adaptation for the seat belt. So things are available and take advantage of that to keep your driving independence. Next one, please. So physical complaints are more related to the body aches and the pain. And then, you know, being in one position is another challenge sometimes for people with back pain or hip pain. So moving and during our assessment, sometimes I give patient a break time, they can get out of the car, move around for a few minutes, and um, those are the easiest ones to handle. Next one, please. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, frequent breaks, you know, establish a routine in your, uh, you know, exercise program, time management, give yourself extra time for mobility. If you're using any adaptive equipment like a walker or a cane, or some people even use wheelchairs or scooters, um, they can definitely have adaptations to hook up their um, scooters to their car, or sometimes, you know, do they have the balance? I check that out too. If they're using a scooter or a walker, I see how they can load. And they're going to address how to take the keys away from them. Sorry. Um, how they can load and unload their wheelchairs, or I'm sorry, their walkers. You know, they should have the balance to be able to move from the back of the car back seat of the car to the driver's seat and that's how um, we can I, I typically check that out if the person it comes alone to the driving assessment and they're using a walker i make sure that i am assessing their ability to load and unload their walker thank you next one please so how do we know what do we offer and how do you know am i safe to try, continue to drive so there are two parts to the driving assessment the clinical assessment and on the road assessment. So on the clinical, next one, please. So what am I doing during clinical? Oh, I'm sorry, going back here. What, if somebody has to participate in a driving assessment, what do we need? We need a prescription from a doctor, from an MD, and with a diagnosis, why the person needs to be referred. You know, um, recently I saw a patient because they had a right knee surgery. The patient um, was referred to see if the patient has the flexibility in the right knee or the strength to continue to use the gas and the brake pedal. And then of course, someone needing a driving assessment, we make sure that they have a valid driver's license. And if they do not have a driver's license, we can get a permit. And Teresa will talk about it a little bit. It's a special instruction permit due to a lot of, I mean, many physicians report the clients to the doc, I mean, to the DMV and the patients are losing their driving privileges. That means they're either driving, get suspended or revoked. And many times the patients are really upset about that the doctor took that step. Of course, you know, the physicians that know me or they're familiar with our program, what they do is they refer to us for a driving assessment to see if the person has the potential to continue to drive or they need to be, I mean, they eventually get reported, but going through different steps first before they get reported to the DMV. And, you know, many times the suspension on the license happens, and then we are able to get a one day permit, a special instruction permit, and DMV has been really helpful with that process. Teresa, thank you for that. With all the people at El Segundo office, Orange office, you know, they know about our program and they are able to give us for a one day permit to do the assessment and we can help them to do that process. Next one, please. So, what does clinical... Carmen, social service manager, I'm away from my... I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear that. Um, so physical assessment, I know I check the sensation, coordination, and I do the vision screening. Um, I also look for any um, cognitive challenges that person is experiencing. 
But just based on what I see on the clinical assessment in my 20 plus years of doing driving assessments, only three people have not taken them on the road. Any person who comes to me, I do give them the opportunity to dr drive with us, getting in the car and see what their real driving looks like. I mean, clinical assessment does give me a little idea about what their challenges are, but I always relate it to how their driving performance is. So in a lot of times I tell my, all my clients, does not matter how you perform on the, do your best, what you're doing on, you know, in the clinical setting or when I do the paper pencil test, but then we definitely rely on the, on the road behind the wheel assessment in combination, we try to give that fair objective assessment to keep our clients safe on the road. Next one, please. So on the road assessment, that includes anything and everything. Like I already mentioned how the person gets in and out of the car, you know, if they're using any adaptive equipment, how they start the car, how do they approach the intersection? Are they paying attention to- uh, Disconnect, I mean, I take it off. It, it does. And um, Abby, Jill, I mean, how is the timing wise? Um, I can move on. I think we need to, yeah, move a little faster, I think, but we're, okay. yeah, we're good. Sure. We can move quickly. Yeah. So on the road, we you know, look at the intersection. So what is my role as a certified driving specialist? You know, I do the function behind the wheel assessment on the road. I help to, do, you know, to, if anybody needs an adaptive equipment, I help them to get that or I help sometimes, you know, say driving is not an option. The outcome is not to continue to drive. Then we help them to provide, you know, some alternative transportation services. And we have a program, Optimal Aging Program Patients. It is covered by Medicare. And it is, um, you know, we help clients with those process in the next, you know, in the, during our sessions. And I just want to say that the driving assessment is not covered by any medical insurances. It is a private pay. So patients have to pay out of pocket. Uh, some of the insurance do cover part of the assessment as part of occupational therapy, but you have to manage that or the family members sometimes approach their uh, private insurances to get the reimbursement, part of the reimbursement. Medicare does not cover driving assessment. They don't think it is necessary. Yeah, next one, please. Uh, so what is the, I just want to wrap up with this is what is critical? I mean, why do we, what is the outcome of this driving assessment? We want, and what kind of recommendations do we make? You know, first of all, we have to know the cause. Is it something the condition is stable? It's happened like a brain injury, traumatic brain injury versus dementia, which is a progressive condition. Is it, you know, we have to make sure that when we making the recommendations, we come, with a plan of what, you know, if they need to be reassessed every nine months, 12 months, depending. Again, the physician makes that decision where the person needs to come back for a reassessment. So we definitely help clients to make that final decision and come up with a plan, share with the patient or the client and the family members, the referring doctors. And at times, if the person needs to be reported to the DMV, I help with that process too. I also help clients to make the decision if they want to self-report. DMV loves to hear that, the patient themselves telling the DMV, I have a condition and I have been evaluated at the Providence or a different hospital or at a whole hospital also, I do the driving assessments. So, you know, I definitely help with that process and it's, it makes it a lot easier for them to keep themselves safe for a longer period of time the huge reliability issue is also covered with that once they are self-reporting or we are helping them to report to the DMV. Next one, please. So there are a lot of resources, American Occupational Therapy Association, trip, next one, please. Um, AARP has a program, uh, Drive Sharp from AAA is also um, a program. They're all computer-based program, but it does not, of course, take you behind the wheel. But there are definitely, AAA is providing senior driving program. But if you have a medical condition, their scope is limited. So then, you know, it's always a good idea to go through a clinical program, which can help you to identify 
and make sure because some of the patients that are coming or clients, they have done 20, 30 hours of training, but the changes, they are still not passing the DMV test. So there has to be uh, you know, a clinical background with somebody who is able to perform our driving assessment. So, so um, physician's guide is also available. Talk to your physician and we can address it that. Next one. Any questions? So driving is just not a privilege. It's a necessity, especially in California. Yeah, so, and I think what we talked about too is uh, saving, because we've got Teresa talking next from the DMV, we're gonna save our questions and answers uh, till after that. So anybody that has that, please write it down so you don't forget your questions and we'll call on people at the end. So we're asking people to just mute themselves and then we'll, that we'll take whatever questions you have at the end. Thank you all. All right, thank you, Pranima. All right, so we've got, um, and I'm not sure, oh, this is, okay, uh, Teresa, this is the DMV, um, first slide, so I, I can't even see who, who else is on here. Are you with us still, Teresa? I am here, yes. Awesome. Ready? Take it away. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is Teresa Thompson. I'm with the California Department of Motor Vehicles as the Senior Driver Ombudsman. And uh, Pernima did mention uh, the Santa Monica incident, which kind of prompted our role within the Department of Motor Vehicles so that seniors had a direct resource to reach out to if they're struggling or having issues with their driving. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, first off here in California, we don't have an age limit regarding driving. We don't say you have to stop driving at 105. You have to stop at 99. That's not our role. We do have driver's license requirements though for persons renewing their license at 70 or older. You will have to report in person to your local DMV when you're 70 and older upon renewal, okay? And you would submit to the vision and written test. And as it shows for our vision test, we're looking for 2040 with both eyes, 20, 40 in one eye, and at least 20, 70 in the other eye. If anyone that comes in um, for this test and they fail, um, they are, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say fail, they don't meet our vision guidelines, then we will give them what's called a report of vision exam to take to their physician regarding any conditions with their vision. It could be just as simple as they need glasses or a new prescription, or they may have cataract or you know diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma those things would be addressed. And then once they bring it back, that form is reviewed to determine if they have to take an actual behind the wheel test. Because notice when you're 70 and older, you come into test, but only vision and written, no driving test. So the only time a drive test is required is if there's an issue with your vision during the renewal process. As far as the knowledge test or the written test, it is a 25 question test. It used to be 18, it was increased uh, just this year and you can miss five, okay, on the test. Anything over five, it's not a passing score. And you have three chances to take that written test. So when you pay for your application at the DMV, you get three chances to test. If you fail three times, then you start your application process over. Uh, you pay a new fee, you fill out a new application, you take another vision test, and then you get a set of three chances to take that written test. That's how it works. If everything is passed, um, during this process for a senior 70 and older, you're given a driver's license for five years. Right now, there's some special provisions in place due to COVID and probably some other things going on right now um, with our health in, in the nation. <laughs> uh, so they are offering seniors to renew online, um, waiving the vision and the written test requirements. So they're letting you renew online if you're eligible. It, you'll know that when you create your account and go into the DMV um, website to do that and, and um, start the process for renewal. If you're eligible, it'll, re, it'll allow you to go right through and pay your fee, no test, and you will they'll use the same photo and then they will mail your, your license in four to six weeks. Uh, next slide. So uh, DMV also, as the licensing agency, has to um, monitor traffic safety regarding health and safety. And so there are physical and medical conditions that we may have that require re regular visits to your doctor, um, follow-up 
visits or just information from your, your doctor or um, pharmacist regarding your medications, because we all have to be responsible regarding what we're taking and the side effects from those medications. That's the important and the key. Um, and working with your physician to stabilize any condition that you may be diagnosed with. Uh, we all know that we didn't ask for any condition that we may have, but you know, acknowledging that there's something going on and that there's a treatment med a medical regimen in place is very important to follow so that you can remain healthy. And then of course, if you're healthy, it shouldn't affect your driving, <coughs> excuse me. Um, also being responsible, again, I can't say it enough, for side effects for medications. When people think of DUI, driving under the influence, they normally think about uh, alcohol, of course. And DUIs do not just deal with alcohol. It also deals with prescription medications as well as illegal uh, drugs or holistic, anything over the counter. So if it makes you feel loopy, you know, dizzy or, you know, whatever it is, you've taken three or four prescription medications and you go out and drive. If an officer observes you or the public observes you and calls you in because you're driving <clears throat> as you're impaired, you know, <coughs> I'm sorry, driving under the influence of anything can make it, it, it's the same as driving under the influence of alcohol. You know, the weaving, the dozing off, all of those things. Um, can lead to having an issue out there on the road. So we have a driver safety branch that deals with that. If you're referred to us, and we'll get to that in a moment. Next slide. So how does someone come to the department's attention? Uh, we have referrals. Doctors are mandated reporters. They must report conditions that may affect someone's driving, regardless of the person's age. I'm senior specific, but this information can be for a driver of any age, okay? So what I tell most of the people that call me, don't change your doctor. Doctors are mandated to report. They're not picking on you. They are making sure that they are being held accountable for what they were licensed to do. And that is to let DMV know that this person has a condition that may affect their driving. And then DMV has a process they will follow. They will reach out to you via mail, um, they will send you what's called a notice of re-examination along with a driver medical evaluation that consists of five pages that must be completed by you and your physician, okay? It's submitted back to the DMV uh, timely to avoid a suspension for not complying. And then we will review that information and schedule you an appointment and talk with you in detail about your driving and any medications and the diagnosis. So that's how that works. Could it result in a suspension? Absolutely. It, it may result in a suspension. That suspension is usually indefinite. It just depends upon what's going on with that condition. Is it stable? Is it progressive? Sometimes, unfortunately, the DMV will have to step in and suspend the license for persons that have progressive conditions that are worsening and affecting their driving. Family and friends can uh, report, report us to the DMV as well. They must identify themselves. DMV does not accept anonymous referrals. So if you're wondering, well, wow, you know, that's not great because I want to report a loved one, but I don't want to be identified. We just can't accept anonymous because some people are malicious. However, there is a form to fill out. It's called um, Request for Regular Reexamination of Driver. I know that's a mouthful. And then the form is DS, D for David, S, Sam, 699. Easy to find on our website if you go to dmv.ca.gov and you type in or search DS699, the PDF of that form will pop up. You can type it, print it, do whatever you need to do. But there is a box on that form where you can um, check to be kept confidential. So we won't tell the person that you, you know, uh, reported them, but it requires your information, your name, your signature, and a phone number. We may have to call and get just, you know, a little bit more information. We may have to call and validate what you're reporting, okay? A self-referral, as Pranima mentioned, um, a driver can report themselves to the DMV. You know, I have been recently diagnosed with Parkinson's or, you know, multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's, whatever the condition is. Or sometimes we will get information from our senior drivers and they'll say, my, my children are concerned about my driving. I want to make sure I'm safe. It may not be a, a condition per se. We'll deal with your skill. 
We may not always need to have a medical, but we may call you in and, and talk with you about your concerns about your driving and your family's concerns, ask if you've had any recent fender benders or accidents, and then send you on an actual driving test. And then that's that person's, you know, um, time to shine, to show us that my skill is still up to par, I'm demonstrating that I can drive safely, or unfortunately, maybe the skill level has deteriorated, maybe they want to take some lessons um, and try it again. So there's several different options um, to keep you driving for as long as you can do so safely. I don't know why DMV has such a bad reputation, okay, because there are a lot of things out there available. And then law enforcement. Um, there's a notice of re-examination that any officer can issue to a driver if they observe their driving and they feel it's unsafe. Um, they can be called to a traffic collision. They can actually observe the driving. And a lot of times with our seniors, which they are actually the safest group of drivers, um, they have their faults as well. You know, driving with a, a, a um, a law enforcement officer behind you with lights and sirens activated, not pulling over because they feel like they haven't done anything wrong. Well, that's not appropriate. You, you pull to the right and stop, you cross your fingers. If they go past you, then you're good to go. If they stop and approach you, then you can talk to the officer and figure out why you're being stopped. So those are things that a lot of my seniors are pulled over for. And also experiencing side effects from those medications, dozing off, having an accident um, you know, while driving, which is not good for anyone. And that's how you are brought to the department's attention. When you're brought to the department's attention, as I mentioned, there is a process you know, for driver safety to actually reach out, get more information regarding the, con the condition that's being reported. You have an opportunity to have an administrative contact, whether it's a re-examination where we're investigating or a hearing, uh, meaning that we've taken an action and now we're talking with you about why the action was taken, what was used to take the action, and then the driver has an opportunity to present evidence. Maybe that's more uh, medical information that's now favorable. Maybe they're diabetic and they did have an episode, but now it's controlled and they're presenting more favorable evidence where the DMV can consider that, give them testing if necessary, and reinstate the driving privilege. So it's usually never uh, the thing of, you just can't have your license ever again. We don't normally operate like that unless, of course, there is an, a condition that's uh, progressive. Alzheimer's dementia comes to mind, of course, because at some point um, in the later stages of that condition or those conditions, we're unable to license. We're just unable to, to uphold having the person drive anymore. I want to just um, talk a little bit about my seniors as far as they restrict their own driving. Self-restrictions, self-imposed restrictions are lovely. It's not a bad thing. It does not indicate that you're not a safe driver. It indicates you're being very responsible and reasonable. You acknowledge there's an issue. I don't drive, I don't see well at night. I don't like to drive at night. There's nothing in the vehicle code that says you have to drive at night, you have to drive the freeway. You know, the expectation is if you drive at night or on the freeway or, or during inclement weather conditions, you're able to do that safely. But if you know that you don't see well at night, doesn't mean you can't drive perfectly well in the daytime, okay? And we have no problem with that. Self-imposed restrictions are lovely. Um, most of our seniors are doing that on their own. It just comes a time where if they come to the department's attention for whatever reason, and we have to impose a restriction, they don't like it. They may say, oh, I haven't driven the freeway in 35 years on their own. But if we say, we're gonna put that on your record, you can't drive the freeway. Oh no, I may have an emergency. Well, if it's been 35 years that you haven't driven the freeway, you probably are not gonna drive the freeway. So sometimes it's just, you know, our position is safety, of course. And sometimes that gets in the way of um, independence. And we do our best to keep you independent. But as the licensing agency, you know, we have a responsibility to traffic safety. And we have to you know, keep that in mind. Next slide. So for some of us that are no longer driving, which is perfectly fine, the DMV offers something free. If you are 62 and older, you can get a senior ID card. Um, it's absolutely free. It's valid for eight years, eight birthdays. And you can also get that as a real ID identification card. And we're gonna talk about real ID in a moment. We don't give away much free at the DMV. But if that's something that you're interested in, you're no longer driving, 
and you're going to now still need um, a valid government ID, which is usually something that's required for different business transactions, I would definitely suggest getting a senior ID card. It's not hard to do, it's free, and it's something that'll be an easy transition from having a license and going into your ID card. Okay, next slide. So Real ID, that's a hot topic. Uh, Real ID is a federally compliant driver's license or identification card. Um, it will be effective May 3rd of 2023, so about eight months from now. Um, it is required to have an in-person visit to get a real ID, driver's license, or identification card. Let me start by saying it is not a separate card. As you can see on the slide, real ID is identified by having that very gold bright bear with the star on the top right corner. So if you're wondering uh, during this time, do I have a real ID driver's license or ID and you take it out, if it doesn't have that bright gold bear on the top right corner, it is not a real ID driver's license or identification card. It requires you to come in person to the Department of Motor Vehicles um, for this federal process and you have to bring specific documents. We need an identity document, just one identity document. I just listed here the most common. These have to be originals or certified copies, no photocopies. So a birth certificate, um, a valid US passport or passport card, so unexpired, and a or a certificate of naturalization or citizenship. Those are just a few documents. We have a list of documents that, we're, that are um, for the identity document on our website. Of course, you can always contact me if you need more information. Um, social security verification is required, so your social security number must be on the application. And then proof of California residency, two pieces of official mail. What's official mail? Something like utility bills, which includes a cell phone, your vehicle or boat registration, um, the title or mortgage, rental agreement uh, with your signature as well as the owner, um, anything from your healthcare provider, not a card, but some mail from your healthcare provider. Um, or bank statements, financial institutions, something of that is required for the identity document. Okay, next slide. If you choose not to get the real ID, which is not mandatory for you to do through the DMV, you will have a driver's license or ID and um, by the photo you see in the top right corner, it does not have a bear. It says federal limit supply, okay? Let's talk a little bit about what does that mean? So Real ID is a federal program because of the events of 9-11, Congress wanted to have something for all states more safe um, with their motor vehicles issuing driver's license and identification since they're government IDs. And so that's why you have to come in person and you have to bring all of this official information to verify you are who you say you are and we have your correct name and social security number. So Real ID on May 3rd of 2023 is required if you're boarding a plane so you're going to go through TSA, that's federal, or if you're going to be um, entering secure federal facilities. That's what Real ID is for. If you choose not to get a Real ID, because you don't have to, but you still want to travel, as long as you have a valid U.S. passport, you can use your passport, no problem. Okay, so if this person here um, with this current photo that indicates federal limits apply, then that indicates that that person will not be able to use that ID or driver's license on May 3rd of 2023 to go through the airport. They're gonna need additional um, ID verification. So maybe their passport or whatever else TSA will accept, okay? And then we'll go ahead and move on. We're Okay, so we're here, disabled persons uh, placards. We wanna talk about that. So an issue of a placard is determined by your physician, surgeon, chiropractor, optometrist, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner or certified midwife, not DMV. We have a bad rap, but we are not doctors at DMV. So we are not allowed to say, yes, you get a placard or you qualify or you don't. That is from your, your physician, okay? Um, new or replacement placards can now be ordered online. A lot of services are available online because of COVID. Um, next slide. Okay, so the Qualifications for uh, disabled persons placards or plates. Um, loss of use of one or more lower extremities or both hands. Um, diagnosed with a disease that substantially impairs or interferes with mobility. Unable to move without aid of an assistive device. And specific documented visual problems, lower vision or partial sightedness. 
this are, these are the qualifications to get a disabled person's placard or plate. There's an application, again, that your physician will fill out regarding this. Once the DMV gets this information, the doctor is responsible for completing the section regarding the criteria. And if you meet that criteria for a permanent placard, which is the blue placard. Next slide. Okay, can I share my placard or plates? No. The placard is issued to one person. That one person is the person whom the doctor certified has a permanent disability. So you cannot lend your placard to another person. You cannot be at home and not feel well and give your placard to your caretaker or your family member to go park in a, in a spot to go get your medication. It doesn't work that way. It has to be used by the person it's issued to. When you receive your placard, you will get what's called an identification card. It looks a lot like a vehicle registration paper, okay? And on that, it identifies the placard number as well as you as the placard owner. That should be carried with you whenever that placard is used. A lot of people throw that piece of paper away. They think it's a receipt. It actually is something that is issued for identification purposes for the owner of the placard. Um, so I would say make a suggestion to maybe make a photocopy, which is acceptable, keep in your wallet so that if you're not in your vehicle, you always have that paper with you. And you do need to show that if it's requested by parking enforcement or law enforcement. Okay, um, next slide. So as far as our service options and resources, um, you can contact our general DMV uh, number at 800-777-0133. Uh, our website is uh, very interactive now. You can ask questions. The one good thing from COVID, if that's allowed to be stated, um, is that it has made DMV move very fast on offering services now available online that does not require you to come into the office. Um, which is a good thing because, you know, it's not fair to have an agency that where you have to go take your business and it takes an entire day. So now, you know, we have um, been forced to, to upgrade our technology, which is good, so that we can accommodate our customers. We also have kiosks um, in local grocery stores and DMV offices where you can do your registration. This year, I wanted to try it. So I went to my local neighborhood grocery store, I shopped, and then at the end of that, I went to the kiosk and I bought my registration. And so I wanted to make sure I kind of tried it for myself to see how it works. It was pretty simple, very expensive, but pretty simple. Um, you have the senior driver ombudsman outreach team to, to um, contact if you have questions. I listed myself because I'm LA County and Central Coast Counties. We have an ombudsman in the Central Valley Inland Empire area, as well as Sacramento and Northern counties, okay? I wanted to make that quick so that we can have questions and answers. And I think I am all done now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you so Teresa. Much. We really appreciate your expertise and sharing all of that really, really helpful and practical information. And my name is Jill Love, and I'm one of the fellow SSG South Bay chapter members, and I'm a geriatric care manager. I'm also going to keep things short so that we have some time for questions, but I know that one of the biggest questions that comes up for families is how to start the conversation when it comes to questioning or, or determining whether or not a loved one is still safe to drive. And hopefully a lot of your questions got answered through Purnima as well as Teresa about resources that are available to you. But just in terms of opening up that conversation, uh, my guidance to clients and to families that I work with is for the loved ones to really document your observations and specific concerns that you have. And this can be a group effort. So if you have multiple family members or even close family friends, people who interact with your loved one uh, regularly and have noticed some concerns or declines, getting their observations so it's not just coming from you might be helpful. But as Purnima and Teresa have mentioned, there could be a variety of reasons why you have concerns. And hopefully there won't be shame or embarrassment uh, surrounding this type of conversation, but really making it very objective and just realizing that circumstances have changed and that maybe taking a closer look at the driving privilege or necessity would be helpful. 
So document your concerns, identify them specifically, and then try to figure out who's the best person to launch this conversation. If maybe it's a sibling of yours, or maybe it is a friend where they can talk about it peer to peer rather than uh, daughter to mother or daughter to son. So also picking the right time of day would be good where you don't feel rushed or where you don't feel like your mom or dad is going to be stressed out. All of those things will help improve your chances of having a positive conversation. And then maybe start by asking them, how do they feel about their driving? And maybe bring up, you know, a recent diagnosis or some new medications that you've already been talking about. Hopefully this doesn't come out of left field for them, but you're just continuing a conversation that you've already been having about their general health and well-being. So you already have some context in place. And then after they've talked about, hopefully they've self-identified some of those concerns, just as Purnima and Teresa have mentioned. And then you can build off of those mentioned concerns and maybe add some additional concerns that they may not have talked about, or maybe they haven't even noticed them themselves. And then if you have permission from those family friends or loved ones to use their names or to use an example of an observation that they noticed, then it, again, helps build your credibility and helps build the case. Um, and then ask them about their status of their registration, their insurance. Hey, when is your driver's license up for renewal? Maybe getting some behind the wheel lessons or something like that will be helpful to help you feel confident or to help you know where, where are some areas that you really need to focus on. Um, and having a perspective of really wanting to preserve your loved one's driving independence will be a lot more beneficial then coming with the perspective that you want to take those car keys away right away. Give them the opportunity to go through these programs and then go from there and see what somebody like Purnima might have to say or how they fare on that DMV exam. And then if you need to, uh, then you can start discussing alternatives to driving. So that's the next slide. It would be really, really difficult to take something like driving privileges away without replacing it with logistical, with practical logistical alternatives. So what I've found is that family and friends are by far the most common um, next step is that somebody steps in to allow their loved one to retire from driving. Um, but then also next most common, if there's financial um, opportunity, hiring a professional caregiver or companion who has already gone through a background check, has been DUI checked with the DMV and with the DOJ, all of those things give a lot of peace of mind that your loved one isn't burdening their children or their friends, and they have somebody who is dedicated uh, to helping them at that time. Church or village volunteers might be a great alternative as well. And then there are city or countywide transportation services that you might want to look into, depending on which county your loved one resides in. And then also, thanks again to the pandemic, we have a lot of services that have moved to delivery. So getting weekly groceries delivered to your loved one or having a manicurist come in so that she can still get her nails done or a Medicare um, a Medicare approved podiatrist can come in and that's part of insurance coverage already. So there are a lot of creative solutions that hopefully you can work together as a team and build on these conversations. It won't be just a one-time conversation, but um, working in a trusting and loving way hopefully will help you um, to get make some good progress with your family. And Grace, go ahead. Great. Now, the, the problem is, what do you do with the car if you decide to um, not drive it anymore? You have to be very, very careful. The car is the hardest thing to do something with, ironically enough. The DMV has um, very interesting rules about cars. Make sure you don't just give it away to somebody. You have to transfer the title. That's the most important th thing to think about. And then I suppose if you're going to um, allow someone to drive it too, they must have a specific license in order to drive it in between times. That's very, very important. Um, so be careful that you're not putting yourself in jeopardy with someone else getting into an accident or stealing it or doing something without your permission. So those are the only things I wanted to say. One thing I've noticed um, just to start the conversation rolling is when you're in your car by yourself, it's often easier to get hypno, be hypnotized by your driving skills. And I think sometimes having someone with you makes it easier to drive. I've noticed too also that the radio 
commercials now allow um, uh, noises and uh, sirens in them. They never used to allow that. So that's a very interesting problem now with distracted driving. So. Well, thank you again for um, the presentation, both uh, Teresa and Pranima and Grace and Jill for sharing as well. Um, thanks for your attendance here today. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you on another Zoom uh, for the Foundation for Senior Services. Thanks very much.